Anjan, in order to really develop aesthetic cognitivism as a real field of inquiry, I want to start with the intellectual foundations of it. And obviously, cognitive neuroscience is high or top on the list, so I'm here to learn. So I think of cognitive neuroscience as uh, asking questions about the mind, what's the nature of the mind, but through the lens of biology, that the mind is implemented through the brain. So what are the properties of our brain that give rise uh, to the mind? And we can think of mind in the broadest of terms. Okay, so uh, what are some of the subcategories of mind that uh, are susceptible to the technologies of cognitive neuroscience? Uh, we can talk about perception, uh, how do our eyes take in different kinds of information and form a representation of the world. Okay. Uh, we can talk about our emotions, that you know, people have the experience of joy, anger, happiness, sadness, uh, you know, what are, okay. what's, the, uh, what's the implementation of those kinds of emotions that most of us experience. Uh, we can talk about language. Uh, the, the fact that we are even able to communicate, that there is, uh, you can almost think of it as a kind of mind reading. There are these sounds that are coming out of my mouth and somehow you know what's going on in my head. Uh, decisions, we make decisions all the time. How do we choose? Uh, we are mobile creatures. How do we know which way to move? How do we navigate through space? Uh, you know, so these are the kinds of things that uh, people in cognitive neuroscience are interested in. Uh, attention is another example of why do we pay attention to some things and not others. So I, I like to kind of have the, a taxonomy of uh, the, the, the whole space that we're looking at sure. before we drill down. So um, you talk about perceptions, emotions, uh, decision making, language, attention. I mean, these are very broad categories. Sure. And within them you have subsets of different mm -hmm. kinds of modalities. Obviously perception right. is the easiest one. Um, so, what are the techniques and the technologies by which you address these questions? Um, there are a number of techniques. Uh, probably the oldest one uh, would be looking at people with brain damage, for mm -hmm. example. So, I'm a neurologist by training. You can go back to the second half of the 19th century, where the first observations were made. Uh, many people might know the name Paul Broca. Uh, he made the observation that when you have uh, in people who had damage to the left side of their brain that language is affected. The remarkable thing about Broca's observation is the notion that you can have what looks like symmetric organs, very similar, but they have dramatically different functions. It would be analogous to my telling you that one eye processes color, the other I processes form. We think it's ridiculous, right? So that's what is so amazing about that original observation. And that continues to be a mainstay of how we understand. Because the exact same structure on the right hand side, if you have any problem, would not, uh, would not affect, affect language. propositional language right. that way. Right. Um, so, but, and that has continued to be a mainstay of how, uh, as a probe to understanding how the mind is implemented in the brain, it's a kind of reverse engineering. Uh, right. so, so that's one mechanism, that's one. looking at the a absence of a, of a brain function sure. to see the behavioral result. Yeah. Okay. The others, uh, that, uh, the one that is uh, quite dominant right now is functional neuroimaging, often referred to as fMRI. And this is a technique where you can tell slight differences in blood flow in different parts of the brain. Uh, and this is predicated on the uh, properties of hemoglobin. When it absorbs oxygen, it has different kinds of magnetic properties, and that allows you to tell uh, where there are slight capillary changes in blood flow, which is driven by neuronal activity. Mm -hmm. And so there you can set up experiments where people are put in certain conditions, and you see where there are changes uh, in the brain. What's a, a classic example of that? Well, a classic example would be if you're interested in how does the brain separate out uh, different aspects of our visual system. So uh, while I gave this example for the eye, but in the brain, actually different parts do process color differently than, say, luminance. Right, so you might have a, an experiment where you have something where the color is changing and you're looking at where in the brain is, is the, this is the response changing. 
Uh, and that might tell you, okay, we think color is being processed over there. Now, the process, because you're looking at, in essence, uh, ch changes in properties of hemoglobin, which reflect um, uh, blood flow, which reflect neuronal activity, right. it's, it's by neurophysiological standards a pretty crude <laughs> technique. There is no question it's crude, right? So and You're dealing with maybe hundreds of millions of neurons in the areas that you're looking at. So but approximately, what's the resolution power? The resolution power is probably on the order of a few millimeters. So a few millimeters, yeah. you know, much it's, less than a half yeah. an inch or something like and that. And then the other issue is the, uh, is the temporal dynamics. Blood oh, right. flow has a very different temporal dynamic <laughs> than neuronal, neuronal flow. Right, neuronal gives a, a, it, a, thousand, a one thousandth of a second is the approximate. Right, and here we're talking about something that actually takes on the order of four to six seconds, seconds. To, to go. So right. this is where you need... It's a five thousand times difference. <laughs> so here, this is where you need really, really smart people who know how to do you know, extract signal from noise and, and really, I mean, there's... And not over-interpret. The danger with fMRI is, is over-interpreting results. There's no I question. I think the, uh, one of the things we say is that the more refined your question, the better you can interpret the data. Right. Uh, you know, sometimes people have the sense that you just throw someone in a scanner, you know, see what, see what happens, yeah. right? Basically, garbage <coughs> in, garbage out. If you don't know what you're looking for, Okay, so, so we have these two techniques in, um, in, in, in damaged brains and um, fMRI um, imaging. Um, apply that to aesthetics. Um, the way that could apply to aesthetics is you create conditions uh, where people are looking at uh, different kind of objects. Uh, let's take faces, for example, if you're interested in the beauty of faces. Uh, you know, when people say aesthetics, often people think of beauty. Mm -hmm. When you say beauty, people often think of people, right? So everybody has a notion of... Nobody thinks of me, by the way. <laughs> um, so you can set up experiments where people are looking at faces that vary in how attractive they are, uh, and then probe for different parts of the brain. So one thing we have found is that in our occipital cortex, which is in the back of the brain, where visual information first comes in, uh, there are parts of the brain that are especially responsive to faces, say, as contrasted with landscapes or architectural interiors. Mm -hmm. We have shown uh, that when you have, uh, as faces become increasingly attractive, you have more neural activity in parts that are specific to faces and not to places. On the other hand, in the front of the brain within our reward systems, uh, and these have names like the ventral striatum and the nucleus accumbens, orbitofrontal cortex, that, that looking at a beautiful object, in this case faces, is a rewarding experience. We get pleasure from this. Mm -hmm. And so you have neural activity in those areas. Uh, and so to a first approximation, the simplest neuroscientific account of the experience of beauty to a face is the simultaneous activation of our visual, something that is specific to what we're looking at, and the pleasure that goes along with that. And so that would be an example of how you might study the aesthetics of faces. You could do that for landscapes, and you can do that for paintings.